Okay, so this is a recording of class number three on Plato's Euthyphro. So let me give you uh, different attachments. Here's the text of the Euthyphro. It's not a very long, well, it's 17 pages. All right, so the setting is that they are at the court, uh, the porch of the King Archon. It's a courthouse and Euthyphro is there because he has a case to bring to court. And Socrates is there because a case has brought and been brought against him um, at the court. So that's very ironic because Euthyphro is bringing his father to court for murder in a questionable case, a case where his family members uh, completely disagreed with him, partly because it wasn't that obvious that it was murder, but partly because according to the traditional notions of righteousness or piety, you respect your elders. That was a part of honoring the gods is to respect your elders and taking your dad to court for prison is not exactly a good example of respecting your elders. So they were outraged and um, Euthyphro gives his reasons. So I'm going to pretend that I'm Euthyphro and try to figure out how he thought, what was going on inside of his head. <clears throat> All right. Okay. So my name is Euthyphro. I'm a religious leader. I live in off on an island named Naxos. I'm from a rural area. And I'm a, I, I watched while well, the Athenians and the Spartans engaged in this very self-destructive war. And then we lost and everything was falling apart. Athens was falling apart. It was becoming degenerate. And I felt like as a religious leader, it was my job to lead and to make sure Athens gets back to God so that we respect the gods and we don't keep degenerating further and further. So um, my father, there was a slave who used to drink a lot, one of my father's slaves. And one day he killed another slave while he was drunk. And my father didn't know what to do about it. He tied the slave up and put him in a ditch. And then he sent a messenger to the Oracle at Delphi to find out what to do. So before the messenger got back, the slave died in the ditch. Now, I had known about that event. Um, and we have a tradition in our country called miasma, which is if you eat a meal with somebody you think is polluted, is wicked, um, the wickedness, you become wicked. You are, you become like the, the friends you keep. And so, that was grating on me. And finally, I decided that this country, this city really needs some religious citizenship, some religious conviction. And as a religious leader, I'm going to take my father to court for murder because somebody has to do what's right. And you can't worry about what other people say. And you can't even worry about what your other family members say. You have to do what you think is right. <clears throat> now, I have, uh, when, my, when my family members said, um, you can't take your father to court for murder. Where is that in the holy books? Well, my answer is that in Hesiod, in our creation story, um, the, this is how the creation story went is that first there was earth and heaven, Uranus and Gaia. First was Gaia, the earth. She gave birth to Uranus, heaven. 
And then they started having offspring. Some of those offspring were monsters and with five heads and 10 arms and all this stuff. And Uranus was both embarrassed by them because they were so ugly and threatened by them because they were powerful. Now, I ask my students, and I'll ask you in class tomorrow, whenever, um, especially a guy, but it happens to mothers too, when they get their ego caught up in their children and they want to control their children and they want their children to really be an extension of their own ego, what happens if they turn out to be less good looking and less athletic and less intelligent? Is it their fault if they're naturally less of these things than their father? Well, no, but he's embarrassed by them. So the embarrassment is crippling, psychologically crippling. It's not their fault. What if he has a kid that's better looking than him and smarter than him and more athletic than him? Well, then he competes against him. He, he wants to win, doesn't like being upstage. Well, is that the kid's fault? That's not the kid's fault. You should want your kid to develop their talents. So the idea there is that fathers should get over wanting their children to be a chip off the old block or anything. Like, keep your ego out of it. Let your kid be whoever they want whoever they were born to be. But Uranus abuses his power. And so he, he buries the um, monsters in the earth, in Gaia. Well, that's what happens when a father basically attacks a child psychologically. Of course, the mother is upset and she embraces that child and the child can hardly breathe, right? He shouldn't have to run to mommy all the time either. And she's really mad, but she doesn't address him directly. And this happens in a male dominated situation a lot. You don't go straight to the source because the source is powerful and um, and, and your public image, you don't wanna go after the CEO or somebody, you have to do it passively aggressive, you have to be passive aggressive. So what she did is she called together all her children and she had a sickle and she said, okay, which one of you is going to cut off his genitals? Okay, no more sex with this guy. And, and to cut off somebody's genitals in the Greek, eros, is what we are passionate about. It's about all those living for the sake of something greater than yourself. It's an erotic passion. It's a kind of energy. Eros doesn't just mean sex drive. It means anything you get really passionate about. So when he abuses his power, she wants to cut off his Eros, which is basically cut off the life force from him. Take everything that makes life worth living away from him. So one of her sons named Kronos, which stands for time, raises his hand. So Kronos cuts off the genitals of his father and throws them into the sea and he becomes king of the gods. Now you can interpret that metaphorically that um, originally there was just earth and sky and it was outside of time virtually because nothing ever changed. Well, as they started having kids, there was a before and an after. Before they had this kid, after they had this kid. So now there is time is a factor in the evolution, the natural evolution of the earth. So naturally, Kronos would cut off his father's genitals and be king of the um, gods because now everything exists in time.
within a context of the natural, the earth, which has been evolving over time and changing. Okay, so then Kronos has kids and he gets paranoid about his kids trying to do to him what he did to his father. And so anyway, it's a great story. I could tell these stories all day. Um, but getting back to the Euthyphro, this is the story Euthyphro has in mind when he says, look, I'm taking my dad to court for murder, but I'm not cutting off his genitals. <laughs> but he can find a quote in Homer to justify what he's done. But because he takes it literally, and also his family members think, well, those stories about the gods are things the gods can do because they're all powerful, but we're not supposed to do that. It's a warning. We're never supposed to act like the gods. But Euthyphro has a different interpretation. And he thinks that if he's a religious leader, he should imitate the gods. And if he really thinks his father is unjust, then he has to take him to court for murder. Um, I will go back to being Euthyphro. So, um, so I was, that's what I was thinking about. And that's why I was sure I was right. Uh, no questions asked. And then I met Socrates on the courthouse steps. And I like Socrates. Socrates is a nice guy. Uh, he has a different sort of interpretation of the holy books. So both of us are kind of religious heretics. We're outside of the norm. Um, but I respected him because he, you know, he had a nice family and he was self-controlled. And I thought Athens was going to hell because of all the self-indulgence and all the lack of discipline and all the... Uh, lack of patriotism and all, and la mostly lack of obedience to the gods. Um, so I was trying to get people back on board, believing in the gods. And then I found out Socrates was also was being taken court to court for murder. Um, because there was Meletus was accusing him of being an atheist and corrupting the youth. So I know, I knew why Miletus accused him of that because he had this other kind of interpretation, sort of an allegorical interpretation of the gods. Nobody else really could figure out what the heck was on his mind, but um, I didn't think it would be a problem. Miletus was just some kind of a, a kook and the, the, lawsuit would be dismissed um, because um, Socrates was obviously a pretty decent guy. Now, um, so what do you think? Do you think I was right? I was trying to get Athens back to religion. I was willing to sacrifice my own father um, for the, to do what I thought was right. All right, that's Euthyphro's argument. So you can think about that. You should write down for class tomorrow um, whether you agree with Euthyphro or not, and then whether you know people who think like Euthyphro. All right, try to think of an example. All right, now I'm gonna be Socrates, so how am I gonna change my costume here? Um, all right, I put it on my head, okay. I'm going to be Socrates because Socrates should be a woman. We need some wise women around here, you know, or we need some acknowledgement that there are a lot of wise women around who don't get credit for it. Okay. Now, Socrates says, I remember that day very well when I was on my way to defend myself in court and I ran into Euthyphro. Um, I knew that he was a religious leader, but I had never heard about this case. Um, I also knew that religious belief is always controversial in every society, but especially in a de democratic society. 
people are always disagreeing about whether the gods exist, about what, what they want from us. Um, but in general, people do know there are powers in the world more powerful than they are, um, either individually or collectively. And so people have to deal with that in some way. Some people are humbled by it and they try to live within these natural limits, to respect these higher powers. But others are arrogant and they try to defy those powers. Um, so people fluctuate. Some people just fluctuate between being humble before God and then um, being arrogant, like thinking they know what God thinks when they don't. Um, I thought the cultural mythology was personifying the powers of the human soul that arise naturally. Um, we need to develop those powers and educate ourselves so we don't go to extremes. So the stories are about what happens when you do go to an extreme and it's telling you, don't do this. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. I know that especially in religion, people tend to go to extremes because they can claim they can believe in something without having any evidence. They're not accountable, right? Nobody can point out anything that will refute their belief. So if it's irrefutable, you can believe anything. <laughs> and I definitely did not agree with that. But I know that some people just think like that. And I don't quite know if they are corrupt, if they're cynical, they're just faking it. If they're corrupt, they really are wicked and they just think this way because their characters are so depraved. Or if they have good intentions, this is just the way they think. And I can never quite figure it out. Um, so religious authority can easily be corrupted by politicians because they can easily say, I'm acting in the name of God. They can easily act like they care about the gods, put on a show, and some people will believe them. Um, and that would undermine a democracy. Democracy depends upon people using their powers of reasoning and their, a love of justice, political consciousness. There's no replacement for that, for preserving democracy. So this kind of blind literalist religion is just opening the door for authoritarianism. People won't take care of problems. They'll just say it's God's will. And then as things get more and more de uh, decline, then some power hungry politician will come along and say, ah, I'm God's representative. I'll take care of it for you. Um, all right. I could not quite tell where Euthyphro was on this continuum. Um, but I did know that Euthyphro had no idea how much danger I was in because he just wrote it off. He said, oh, your your court your case will be dismissed. <laughs> he he really was naive about that, and um, he really didn't understand that Melitus was obsessed about blaming me for the loss of the war because I questioned authority figures, including religious authority figures. I didn't think. I did not blindly obey. And he really thought that was why we fell. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, Euthyphro also thought that by going out on a limb like this and taking his father to court and everybody sees it publicly, that he was really sending a message that would get people back to God and back to discipline and back to respect for their families. 
when actually it had the opposite effect. People were even more um, anxious about what is it we're supposed to do? And it, we can't know any of this stuff. We can't fix any of this stuff. We can't, all we do is fight with each other. Euthyphro thought he was saving the family. He was really destroying the family. He thought he was saving the city and he was really destroying the city. He thought he was part of the solution. He was really part of the problem. Um, and it's it, no matter what, as these fundamentalists undermine people's basic sense of morality, <coughs> and destabilize the society, a power hungry politician will always blame the liberals. <laughs> he won't blame the, the e extreme conservatives because those are the ones behind him that back him up, but he will blame the liberals. That's why we're suffering because people don't blindly follow. Um, okay. So the Euthyphro is just one example of it's the title Euthyphro is the title of the name of a person who is a tragic character. He, he has reasons for what he does. He thinks he's doing what's good and he's really doing harm. So every one of my dialogues has a title about some mistaken opinion that contributed to the ultimate collapse of Athenian democracy. So you can't just blame one person. There's no one scapegoat. There was just this happened and this and this and this. And together there were enough people with enough corrupted judgment that the city could not survive. There were not enough people cultivating practical wisdom, figuring out how to talk to each other and how to solve problems. All right, so in the dialogue with Euthyphro, every part of the dialogue has a point and a really important point. Um, but I know Plato's dialogues are not easy to read. They're sort of disorienting, um, but I hope you can try to get into it. So when Socrates asks Euthyphro, what is piety? So how, did, how does he start with the question? Well, he takes his father to court for murder because he's convinced this is what the gods want. And um, Socrates just says, are you sure? And Euthyphro says, if I didn't have a hotline to God, I wouldn't be a religious leader. That's why I'm a religious leader is because I have a better sense of God's will. So then Socrates just says, okay, you need to tell me what you need. I need to get educated by you because Melitus is about to kill me for being impious. And so if I can just learn the lessons of you, since you know everything, <laughs> of course, Socrates is being a little sarcastic. Um, Although it is, you know, if you really did have a hotline to God, it would be very helpful. The trouble is people disagree and they're not going to stop disagreeing. But anyway, for Euthyphro, it's cut and dried. Piety is doing what I'm doing, prosecuting anyone who's guilty of murder or sacrilege. Well, okay, even if it's your father or mother, not prosecuting them is impiety. So miasma, you will be polluted if you don't prosecute them. Okay, and that's my defense, is that I'm not as bad as what Kronos did to his uh, father, or Zeus also sort of did a, did a job on his father, Kronos. Um, then the next definition, piety is what is dear to the gods. Okay, well, the trouble is in Greek mythology, the gods disagree. Um, okay, and Euthyphro says, but they all agree that whoever kills another unjustly should be punished. Well, the trouble is people, people disagree on who kills unjustly, right? There's, there's just 
killings and unjust killings. So, for example, if a woman has been abused for years and one day she just has enough of it, and gets out a gun and kills the abuser, is that murder, right? We also have first degree murder, which is premeditated. We have second degree murder, which is um, an accidental situation. And we have third degree manslaughter, which is an act of passion. I mean, and then there's many other nuances in terms of the, the sentences being passed down. Um, there's just lots of distinctions people make. But everybody agrees in principle that if you kill someone unjustly, you should be punished. <laughs> Nobody agrees on who killed someone else unjustly and what the punishment should be. All right, so, the, so that didn't get us very far. So then Euthyphro says, it's what all the gods love is what's pious and holy. Well, okay. So then I wanted Euthyphro to prove that all the gods would agree that what he's doing is right, right? Because humans don't agree. So what evidence do you have that the gods would agree? And Euthyphro just said, well, I could show you, but we, I don't have time. Um, so then Socrates says, well, actually the main point is this anyway, is, is what is wholly loved by the gods because it's holy, or is it holy because it's loved by the gods? All right, so turn off the video. I want you to think about that question and vote. I'm gonna ask you to vote tomorrow. Is what is holy loved by the gods because it's holy, or is it holy because it's loved by the gods? And then why do you think that's important? So I'm not going to give you the punchline right now. That's a very important question. And I hope you understand why. OK, so then in the second, the third section, piety is a part of justice that attends to the gods, and the other part attends to men. All right, so we are going through big questions in our society right now about which aspects of the legal system are attend are about men without any reference to God and which part of um, justice is, is there any part that actually includes references to the gods, right? Or is um, justice in relation to the gods nothing to do with the laws, right? It's just, um, justice which relates to the gods and justice which relates to men and the laws are concerned with men um well what kind okay so is it true that well now that abortion is illegal honestly that i knew this was going to happen and i used to tell students this well in texas if you suspect that somebody got an abortion and you have all this uh, surveillance, all this information, like the police can find out if you made a phone call or um, if you traveled right across lines, across state lines. I mean, you can be traced. And, I, and if you suspect it, I, I think this law is in place in Texas. You get a $10,000 reward for reporting somebody that you think is, has gotten an abortion. Well, the question is, should parents send their daughters to prison for getting an abortion? Now, technically, people who believe in capital punishment would believe the killing of an innocent life deserves capital punishment. So are we gonna have a capital, abortion as a capital crime? If we do, um would parents what would people think if a parent brought their daughter to court for murder by getting an abortion and i don't know the daughter could get some prison time but would people say oh wow those people are really pious those people really believe in god and that's evidence because they took their daughter to court 
for murder, or they reported her and made 10,000 bucks. <laughs> uh, I don't, I think there might be some people who would say, it's your daughter, like screw it. If somebody else finds out, it's nothing you can do about it, but you're not gonna take your daughter to court for murder because that's different. <laughs> Um, I don't know, but I don't, I don't have an answer to the question, but I know that people will debate that question. No question about that. So is there a part of justice that deals with piety? Like family members are sacred. They're, they're different than just the average Joe. Well, then you don't have a democracy, of course, but there's people who think that. They would think, I'm not going to take my daughter to court for murder. Um, all right, so then there's there's that. What is it? What is it that's related to piety and what's related to justice? Serving men. Um, the next question is, what sort of service do we owe the gods? How should we relate to the gods? Is it the kind of service that slaves get to give to their masters, right? Is it a slave master relationship you have with God? And Socrates says, well, in that case, the masters need <laughs> the services of the slaves. Do the gods need us? No, <laughs> no, Euthyphro doesn't want to say that. Um, okay, and so here's the next question. Um, do we attend to the gods for the gods sake because the gods need us or do we attend to the gods for our sake because we need them right um so what other okay so what other kind of services what's analogous does medicine does the art of medicine attend to the doctor or does the doctor attend to the art of medicine? And what does medicine produce? Health, that's the goal. Does the art of shipbuilding attend to the shipbuilders or do the shipbuilders attend to the art of shipbuilding to produce ships? Does the art of piety serve human beings? or do human beings serve the art of piety? And what does the art of piety produce? <laughs> What's the goal, right? So again, I'm gonna leave that open and I want you to stop the video and think about it. Does medicine attend to the doctors? Does medicine serve the doctors or do the doctors serve medicine? The shipbuilders, the shipbuilding serve the shipbuilders, or do the shipbuilders serve shipbuilding? Does piety serve humans, or do humans serve the art of piety? And what is the product? Um, what are the similarities and differences between these goals? Health, ships, and piety. All right. So then Euthyphro says, uh, piety is learning how to please the gods, right? He gets fed up with all this stuff. Enough is enough. He says, look, it's pleasing the gods in word and deed by prayer and sacrifices. Those who pray together stay together, right? If we go back to church, it'll save our families and it'll save our society, state. Just like when people are impious, God wills the destruction of the society. So we need to be pious to regain our social order. Um, but I thought, Euthyphro thought he was trying to return the society to stability and discipline, but I thought he was undermining it, right? I thought my actions, Socrates, was preserving my family and country by making people accountable that by exposing corruption. 
the only way to avoid instability and then authoritarianism. Okay, so then when we go from this pleasing the gods by word and deed, well, what's what's the goal? What do you get out of it? Well, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back, right? It's like doing business with the gods. Human beings honor and please the gods and the gods give them stable families. Does that mean good things happen to good people and bad things happen to good to bad people? Well, that isn't always true, right? Bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people. Um, the good guys don't always win. Um, if something bad happens to you, are, you, are people going to tell you, well, you must have offended God? <laughs> or this is just testing your faith? Or is it just, there's, it's not a business deal. Like your relation to God shouldn't have any ulterior motives. I'm going to do this because I'll get something for it. It shouldn't have, it shouldn't be a cost-benefit analysis. Um, calculating your own self-interest. Well, there is a prosperity gospel, uh, which is God helps those who help themselves. If you're prosperous, it's, it's a sign that God loves you, which is so corrupt because, I mean, that just begs for people to engage in um, <laughs> excuse me, business practices that are either flat out corrupt or just constantly cutting corners and not being an honest broker. And then, you know, going to church and people see how wealthy you are and you can, they'll think you're blessed by God. Okay. Um, yeah, now we have the abortion problem and that'll play itself out. Um, a child died of SIDS. Okay, so in the name of God, people disagree on a whole lot of stuff. Um, but I do want to tell a story about this article. So this is my friend, Hope, Hope Barker, a uh, high school friend. And her, her child died of SIDS. So in the, in the Hilster family, um, Hope had told her mother when she was in kindergarten, I'm going to marry Danny. <laughs> so she marries Danny Hilster. Actually, I will probably see her in a couple of weeks. Um, and they had the perfect family. I mean, this was two families that had known each other for years. And the family never had girls. They always had boys. So it was two generations of boys. And then Hope had two boys. And this was a third generation of boys. And then she had this little girl. And um, the kid, the child died. Okay. Um, so I had taught the Euthyphro dialogue for years. And I thought, yeah, I don't make business deals with God, right? I don't think if I worship, if I go to church, I'll be successful at work or I'll, you know, whatever it is I wanted. I did not think that. But it's crazy in a critical moment like this, my instant reaction was, well, not them, right? They have the perfect family. Like they shouldn't have that happen to them. And then you realize somewhere in your brain, you're making a deal with God. Like you think there's some connection between being religious and being successful or avoiding suffering. And there just isn't. Um, I know that my son also in 2019, so my son has a reputation, honestly, I mean his mother, but he has a reputation for being a very amazing man. And he started an inner city charter school, very difficult job. And his, he was respected and everything. Well, then he got cancer. And I know that people were thinking, well, not them. <laughs> like, they have the perfect family. 
like they had two little kids. Um, I think they were ages four and nine. There's yeah. And, you know, I know that people were thinking like that. And I, I got over it. I mean, I, Carl and I talked about that. Well, it's not, there's not some guy that's out to get you or something. He says, I know him all. But um, still, he was happy when people prayed for him and just had goodwill for him. Really, prayer could be some hotline to God and how come you don't give me what I want? But it could just be a way of expressing goodwill that you care about other people. And um, that was... That's just another example. So you will have examples throughout your life of unjust suffering. And you're going to have to think about what this means, right? If you're not religious, you'll give a scientific explanation or whatever. But really, even if you're a secular humanist, you should have a worldview that includes human vulnerability and that people suffer and they suffer unjustly. And that that's something you care about uh you're not indifferent to it um just because it's human and it's human suffering um okay this is important god is not a republican or a democrat so this happened after 9 11 it just everything became god's will and god is punishing us because the country was being taken over by um the liberals and the feminists and the gays and all this stuff. Uh, Jerry Falwell, Pat uh, Robertson. And the people who put out this flyer show that, argue that um, there's lots of different issues. And you can, you know, your worldview can include the monotheism, the one God. And you can relate it to that, but there will be other Christians who disagree with you totally, and there'll be other humanists who actually agree with you. So the you know it isn't humanists over here and Christians over here; it's Christian humanists, and then it's Christian anti-humanists and uh, humanist anti-religionists. Okay, but I. I do think you have to get, just get a sense that it's complex and ambiguous and you have to be fair to opposing points of view. Um, and here are the affirmations of humanism. We have a whole section in the class about humanism, but here's just a list of the principles. You can look at those. You can look at which of those are consistent with your worldview and you can decide if you are uh, just a secular humanist, a spiritual humanist, a Christian humanist, or an anti-humanist um, based on this list. Probably you accept, agree with some of them and not others, but that's kind of the point, is that it's complex. Um, then this article is about um, how we should react to 9-11. And um, Let's see. Uh, okay, his conclusion is that military operations are not enough. It's not enough to go bomb people. Uh, we have to worry about our inner lives. We have to worry about our norms and our values. Um, and right after 9-11, there was a lot of talking about how that we should use it as a way to, to bring the country together. But that is not what happened. So here's an article about uh, Matthew Dowd. He gets interviewed on the TV now. Uh, so he switched parties, but he criticized the president because he wanted uh, the president to unify the country under a, a shared sense of sacrifice, um, but that's not what happened. And he wanted to, at least for the president, to call out the torturing we were doing and to stop it. 
And actually Bush supported it. I read a whole 350 page book about our torture program in Abu Jari prison. It was, it was terrible. Um, uh, okay, so he thinks that if you are a believer, you want to restore balance when things don't, don't turn out the way they should, right? Just being quiet is not an option. So um, he himself was part of the process, the way the Bush team um, set out to win votes by exploiting the divisions between the Democratic states and the Republican states. And so it was called, these were called wedge issues. So God, guns, gays, abortion, um, taxes, these are all wedge issues. They drive, they separate people. And if you keep feeding on those, then people don't talk to each other anymore. So this happened after 9-11. So that's 20, over 20 years ago now. Um, okay, so he felt like he was sort of in love with George Bush. He had respect for him. And then as things started to go south, it's hard to admit, you know, that he isn't the person you thought he was. And so Mr. Dowd talks about that. Um, and then there's an article uh, editorial about that. So I, I think it's interesting. I also think I picked, I kept these articles because I do think you need to have some sense of what happened after 9-11, even though it was a long time ago, it really affected our country. And now, now, this was when the Federal Society was organizing uh, to get lawyers who had a very conservative perspective, and they would become members of this Federal Society. They got put on a docket, a list of people for Republican presidents to choose from, and when putting people on the Supreme Court. And so that has happened. Now, some of you might think it's a good thing, and some of you might think it's not, but it definitely is a thing. Like it had been going on before 9 11, but it all got put on steroids after 9 11. It got worse. Um, so, this article is about yes, the Arabs um, are, hate us, but also we have religious bigotry in our country too. And so he talks about. Uh, Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son, um, and then he just, yeah, I mean, Islam is spreading. And so I do think you have to think about why it's spreading. Well, because the Muslims in Africa, uh, had, the people have positive character traits, egalitarianism, a lack of hierarchy, greater hospitality, uh, a system of, of charity. Okay, and then on the other hand, Christianity is corrupt and hierarchical. So it is important to figure out not whether people convert, but why they convert. So whenever you act in a degenerate way, whenever you get drunk, or you get start whoring, drinking and whoring, um, being sexually promiscuous, you, um, you're basically recruiting people to Islam. They're gonna look at Christians and say, well, Christians are corrupt. So where can I go if I really wanna have take God seriously and pray five times a day. Now, of course, this is oversimplified, um, but I think the author, Nicholas Kristof, just wants to shake you up a bit and change the stereotypes in our minds. Okay. Uh, 
the Quran can be quoted for any purpose, just like the Bible. And we will study that. We will look at quotes. Um, and then this one is about um, Abraham Lincoln. But we should have, and we really should have, it should have been a wake up call for us to get on um, green energy because our animosity in the Middle East is because of their oil, obviously. It has to do with uh, war for resources. So, and then we should have had some sacrifices and encouraged national service as a replacement for military service. Um, instead, you know, he started out this whole Homeland Security Agency and that costs a lot of money, but that didn't necessarily solve anything. Um, let's see. So, yeah, he didn't postpone or roll back a tax cut. He cut taxes for, mostly for the rich. Whenever there's a tax cut, it, it disproportionately goes to the rich because they're the ones who pay for the political campaigns and then tell the winners, well, you have to have a tax cut for mostly for the people who donated to your campaign. Um, okay, and then this point is about heightened political consciousness. So that's what I'm talking about, that the Greek, the way the system was set up was to get people to have a political consciousness. Um, and sort of understand what is the role that politics play in society. Um, all right. And this is a, an interview with a very hateful um, anti-Muslim guy. This is the discussion of a guy that worked in our military who really um, thought that God is involved in wars to a, or to a higher level. I mean, you shouldn't put people in charge who think that what they do is, is driven by God. I don't think, right? You're gonna make some really strange decisions. Your decisions as a military leader ought to be just based on strategy and science and social science, but not blind faith. And this is Abraham Lincoln, discussion of Lincoln's view of religion. So that's it for today. I think that's about an hour. And I look forward to uh, hearing you speak. And I really do want you to um, address some of those questions. What is something holy because the gods love it or do they love it because it's holy? Number one, the second one is do, um, does the art of shipbuilding serve the shipbuilder or does the shipbuilder serve the art of shipbuilding? Same with medicine and the same with piety. Um, and what is it that piety produces? It isn't, is it like a ship, an external product? Is it like health? Is it physical health? Is it some kind of psychological health? You know, what do you think it is? Why do you go to church? Or why were you raised to go to church? Or why didn't you go to church? Why were you not raised to go to church? Whatever. Okay. <laughs>